Hi, my name is Lars. I'm from the GoTo team. Um, we're doing a GoTo unscripted episode here at GoTo Copenhagen. We're here in person finally again, and it's great to uh, see our speakers. I am joined today by Thomas Vitali and Lasse Heugel. Um, if you wouldn't mind just saying a few words about yourselves so that people watching know who you are. Thomas, maybe you go first. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Thomas. I work as a senior software engineer at uh, Systematic, a Danish software company. I'm really passionate about anything cloud native technologies. I like working with Spring and uh, contributing to open source projects. Okay. And you, Lasse? Yeah, my name is Lasse Holger. I work at Trifog in Aarhus um, as a cloud specialist, I think it's called. Um, yeah, focused in around Kubernetes and building uh, cloud native environments and, and platforms, stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the topic today, as people might hear from your descriptions, is cloud native and Kubernetes and all things related. Um, so my first question, I think, is: Is Kubernetes and cloud native? Is, is that do you think that is a concern for application developers, or is that more of an infrastructure concern? Well, <laughs> ideally, uh, they shouldn't have to worry too much about the uh, the underlying runtime. Okay. Like if you're running an uh, old school Java project, you may be running on a JBoss, or you may be running on uh, Tomcat or whatever, and you know that you're running on it, but you're not really concerned with it unless you're actually configuring it, right? And I think that we should strive for getting the same level of experience in Kubernetes. Um, so I think a, a, a key term is to have a um, an internal platform and a platform as a service, uh, either a real platform as a service from one of the cloud providers, or then you build one yourself if your company is uh, if your company is big enough to do that. Uh, so take away the complexity and and then just let the the app um, developers do whatever they need to do to fulfill their jobs. I think that's the the key. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, developers should have a nice. Uh, it's called developer experience, which is also one of the. Uh, territories where a lot of vendors are uh, really fighting each other to provide the best developer experience because now Kubernetes is a given, but mm -hmm. it's more of an operational concern. So developers want to focus on business logic. So uh, really, we should strive to provide the best experience to developers. So yeah. hiding a lot of complexity. And uh, in that regards, for example, Knative built on top of Kubernetes uh, already provides a, a nicer abstraction for developers. So without considering a lot of different concerns, uh, that are still good to know as a developer, like the main concepts about mm -hmm. Kubernetes, because it's a different environment. But then the daily job, yeah, it's uh, it's really important that yeah. we can focus not on the infrastructure but on what provides value, the the product. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. You need to know the constraints of the platform that you're running on. Like if you're on Kubernetes, then pods can be rescheduled. You can have multiple replicas of them. Uh, you need to provide a health check. Those kind of things. You need to set set aside memory requests and limits. Uh, so, so those are the constraints that you're working within, and that that uh, gives you some uh, uh, challenges when when you're doing an, an app. Like you can't rely on just writing f f uh, things to a file, and then uh, your pod restarts and everything is gone. Like so, it, you need to know the constraints of the environment. But other than that, you shouldn't be too concerned about it. Yeah. Wh what are you doing in, in Systematic? Are you building like an internal platform? Uh, that yes, uh, we are doing that. Uh, as we are a large company, so we have uh, different projects, a different level of uh, what we can call a cloud native transformation. Uh, in particular, in my project, we are uh, really aiming at uh, moving to using a platform which provides a great developer experience because, of course, we want to be able to focus on the business logic. So uh, at the company level, we are working on uh, uh, such a platform with uh, also that uh, capability in mind, so not just uh, aimed at uh, operators but also the interface part, the user interface, mm -hmm. which is really critical, I think, for uh, having a successful platform. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's, like you said, developer experience is a, it's like the next big mm -hmm. thing. Like we have Kubernetes, that's as you said, a given, and we have multiple vendors coming up with different ways of of, of enhancing that developer experience. We have something like Backstage from from Spotify that's now open source. It's like an internal, uh, yeah, Backstage uh, where you can deploy your app and you can monitor your apps and have templates and those kind of things, and that's one of them, right? Um, then the next thing is like, how if I'm going to Kubernetes, do I run a Kubernetes cluster locally when I'm doing my development and and, mm -hmm. and orchestrating my my services in there? What's the, what are you doing there? Um, and and I think that depends on the on the size of the project. Yeah, that's uh, also an interesting aspect. The the inner loop 
for, mm -hmm. for developers. So do we really want to run Kubernetes? If we do, then we need that uh, knowledge also spread out across developers. So it, sometimes it's not really worth it if we have big uh, infrastructures, big architectures. So a tool like tele, uh, Telepresence, for example, that allows to get this, uh, the whole application running on a cluster somewhere, and then we can uh, just run on our computers uh, only the components we're working on. And yep. then the traffic is uh, routed and proxied through uh, the cluster. So we don't have to install Kubernetes and not even think about it. I think that's, uh, that's a really cool uh, tool that we have. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is, um, and it, it routes the traffic from the live cluster down to your local yeah. machine, so you can attach a debugger. Yeah. yeah, and that's the also the ultimate uh, experience with uh, uh, environment uh, parity. So we are we are really using the, the real thing. We are not simulating maybe a local cluster with different features, but we have the real thing. We have all the nice features from the platform as well, like uh, maybe observability, for example. We can uh, check tracing and uh, monitoring. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's like you said. Um, when we're running on on a platform like this, um, it becomes a it can it kind of becomes a challenge. Like if you're doing DevOps, and I think you should, uh, then the the app developers will also be running it in production, and they will be reacting to alerts, and they will be on call for that application, and that forces you to have at least a, a, a tiny amount of knowledge mm -hmm. about Kubernetes. Like, is this problem that we're seeing is that related to Kubernetes, or is it related to my application? And maybe you should also have a, a platform developer on call as well, but you need a, a cursory knowledge mm -hmm. of Kubernetes as well. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on having, or maybe designing a self-service API for developers, so to, to make things even clearer, like what is responsibility for the product team, and what is for, uh, uh, like responsible, the, the platform team, and having also a better understanding of, yeah, if I get a call, so I is it me, uh, can I fix it, or do I need uh, someone else with a different set of skills to help me figure out what's going wrong? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question, because uh, I think that uh, everybody right now is running towards Kubernetes, and now we have Kubernetes, and it's, it's all great, and now we're building abstractions on, on top of it. So you in Systematic, you're building an, extra an, an, an abstraction on top of it, we are building another abstraction, and backstage is another abstraction. Uh, like, what is an what is an app? What's a deployable unit of execution? Mm -hmm. um, and we see this like this plethora of different definitions of abstractions, right? Or different levels of, of, of abstractions. Um, and uh, so, I'm all for having an internal API to have a self-service uh, platform as a service in your company, but. I think we should be aware of what is outside of your own company because you may be reinventing the you know, the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, we, in my company, we are doing something slightly different. We are moving closer to the hosting provider, actually, the ones that set up the cluster mm -hmm. because I'm not setting up a cluster. I have infrastructure guys who knows yes. more about networks than I do mm -hmm. and mo knows more about disks and mm -hmm. RAM and all of that, those kind mm -hmm. of things. And we are actually moving those closer to, to the app team. Uh, so that, for instance, a, a people sitting in a, in a, a network operating system, that they can react to an alert, like saying, okay, this application is now returning 500. Mm -hmm. And it used to not do 500. We haven't done a deployment in a month, so something's off here. Yeah. Uh, and they can, they can see that alert and kind of have to uh, determine, is this platform related or is this application related? So it's the same dashboard for uh, platform metrics, platform alerts, as uh, application alerts mm -hmm. and application metrics. I think that's where we want to go because Kubernetes is so complex, super complex, that you can spend your entire career just focusing on that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and at the same time, application development is also super complex and you need to focus on that. Uh, so quite uh, quickly, we have this dev and ops Parity again, and we don't want that. We want those guys to be the same guy, uh, ideally, right? And if that's not mm -hmm. possible, at least they should be in the same room. Um, yeah, so that that's my 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 view. Yeah, I think it. that's really important. Like the whole DevOps philosophy of combining people with different uh, skills, different uh, roles, and together collaborating to yeah to the same goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important. And yeah, there's always the risk to end up having these uh, silos. Now we have. We, we used to have development and operations. Now maybe we uh, define this uh, product and platform or platform silos, but we really 
the one to do that probably and yeah. I think that's also why it's important the, having this API between uh, between the two teams mm. but I like what you said about not reinventing the wheel I think it's really important we have out there like the cloud native landscape is like <laughs> <laughs> wow uh, <laughs> It can be even scary the first time we look at it, but there's so many great open source tools out there that uh, we can use. So I think it's uh, important also to, uh, yeah, not reinventing the wheel and maybe adopting some uh, uh, standards that are, uh, yeah, starting to uh, being used a lot. And I mentioned earlier Knative, for example, that is used a lot by Red Hat, by VMware, by Google to build their uh, serverless platforms, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also uh, a nice abstraction to have uh, in a more standardized way, so we're not reinventing the wheel, and then maybe uh, on top of that, adding uh, some other tools that we can uh, really embrace. Of course, customizing a bit, but if we keep the interface based on uh, open source projects, then we really uh, yeah, make things easier for everyone, I think, because when we have a problem, we, can, uh, we have a large community uh, available yeah, we <laughs> all do. over the world. We, we can uh, yeah. talk with them, we can even be part of uh, the solution and contributing to the, the the open source projects that we use to build the platforms. Yeah, yeah, and I, I sometimes think of the Kubernetes, uh, the cloud native landscape as like an app store for uh, off-the-shelf uh, software. And it used to yeah. be that if you wanted to set up a database, you just go to that vendor and ask them, could you he please help me set up that database? And it has like specific requirements for network and memory and CPU, and it has its own yeah. configuration language, and it had its own uh, requirements uh, like I need to multiple replicas need mm -hmm. to be behind uh, reverse proxy or whatever it was, yeah. and all of those different applications, whatever it might be, had their own configuration language, had their own uh, specialized needs, uh, and I think a tool like Helm, which is often criticized for uh, obvious reasons, mm -hmm. uh, it it really um, unionizes configuration. Like you can you can template with Helm, you can template a configuration file, for instance whether that be JSON or it be YAML or it's like a, uh, a Java properties file, you can use that. So it, the interface becomes the Helm values file. So that's like the same configuration language that you're using. And now you're just building small pieces of uh, adapters around your configuration file, and then you have the same interface for all of them. I think that's really, really cool. And it's the same kind of, uh, it's the same way you deploy it, like Helm install, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's the interface becomes better and the developer experience becomes better. Um, and you can do that for all, almost all of the, the tools in the cloud native landscape. Um, I think that's, that's really cool. And, and it, it lowers the barrier to entry to, uh, like if I wanted to run a uh, highly available NATS cluster on my Kubernetes cluster, like that's Helm installed and then yeah. set replicas to three, then it's highly available, it's yeah. uh, uh, sharded and all those, those things. If I wanted to do that in the old days, Oh boy. Oh yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> like I needed to set up three different VMs yeah. and connect the network between them and then I needed to start the service on all of them and they needed to join in some way over the network with a token, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, it's a whole new world now and it feels natural for developers because we are used to install uh, tools from uh, our operating system using APT on Linux or maybe Homebrew on Mac OS. Mm -hmm. And yeah, with Helm we, we get the same experience so we don't have to learn a new approach. Yeah. But uh, the result is just so powerful, I it guess. Is. Just yeah. the command, and you get uh, maybe a high available uh, Redis cluster. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's great. It is great, and uh, it's also zero downtime deployments, and you can do rolling upgrades. Yeah. You can do all those kind of things that is like before time, uh, before Kubernetes. It was kind of hard, uh, and all of the servers needed to be patched. And I hope you remembered your patch windows because <laughs> there was always uh, in the middle of the night, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from from midnight to twelve on the thirty first of whatever mm -hmm. month you had a patch window, now you can just do it because yes. things uh, can, can, can react to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's great. Mm -hmm. It is. So I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to touch a little bit on, on the migration story. So if you're not really doing Kubernetes, Cloud Native uh, yet, uh, you've mentioned that there's a lot of complexity involved and you've also mentioned that there's a lot of benefits. So what, what kind of trade-offs do you think should be considered before you do that and do you have any sort of good advice for people wanting to take uh, their old school Rails monolith into that kind of ecosystem? Well, I th I'd like to say first that, uh, like usually, of course, we uh, associate cloud native with Kubernetes, but we can be cloud native even without Kubernetes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's the most popular choice, but uh, in uh, a lot of uh, situations, we are uh, really good with going with uh, platform as a service, 
provided by uh, cloud vendors instead of working with Kubernetes because maybe the, the use case is uh, not that complex. So maybe yeah. adding Kubernetes might be uh, too much. Yeah. And I like what um, Cornelia Davis, uh, WeWork CDO says uh, about cloud and cloud native. Like cloud is where the computation happens and cloud native is about how we build software that runs on the cloud and yeah. takes advantage of the, the feature. So I think an imp the first part, or at least from a developer point of view, the first part of a migration would be uh, focusing on making the application cloud native. So yeah. the 12 factor methodology, for example, comes to mind as th mm -hmm. the first step. So being sure that we work with uh, uh, stateless applications, that we have externalized configuration, so we don't have problems with yeah. uh, files and uh, all those uh, uh, traditional ways that really uh, don't play nice in a cloud environment. And um, even without moving directly to the cloud, just by doing that, I think we, we can make uh, deployments and operations easier. Because now we have a really a full set of uh, standardized practices to mm -hmm. deal with cloud native applications that uh, already just by doing that, so changing the way that we build applications uh, can help. And after that, of course, if we once we start with a cloud native application or future to be <laughs> cloud native application, yeah. Then migrating to Kubernetes uh, involves a lot uh, the platform and help from the platform team and being sure that uh, like I the interface is clear for developers so how to take advantage of uh, these new technologies and new ways of uh, managing applications. Yeah, I agree. Like if you're not cloud native, you have a monolith, like fix the basics first, fix your configuration, fix your logging, fix your metrics, like those kind of things. You can do that in your current environment. Yeah. And, and get a better uh, running application. And another thing I've, I want to mention is that you should also <laughs> take a look at your test suites. If you have no tests, then moving to yeah. Kubernetes, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it, right? Um, so that's all, yeah, it's often mentioned as an afterthought, like, all oh, right, we need to write some tests. But it's, it's crucial if you want to go for cloud native and you want to go to Kubernetes and to continuous delivery and we want to go faster, but you need the, the tests to prove that you're not breaking things all the time. And uh, chances are, if you have a money lift, maybe your tests are not that good. Maybe you have uh, highly coupled uh, yeah. stuff that interacts in strange, strange ways. Um, and that application is not, <laughs> it's not suitable to be moved <laughs> no. to Kubernetes, right? Because yeah. that just adds more complexity. Now you're doing yeah. uh, network calls to do methods, for instance, or you are now, uh, <laughs> At the uh, you're at the mercy of the Kubernetes scheduler, like okay, so now you're having a running application, it gets uh, sent a kill, uh, gets sent a sick term by Kubernetes because it's going going to be relocated uh, to another worker node. Like if your application can't handle that, no. yeah. then don't go to Kubernetes right because it'll just add more problems. Yeah, exactly. It will. Then sometimes like. Um, when talking about cloud native migration, mm. usually we talk about uh, uh, splitting the monolith into microservices. Um, maybe that's not a requirement, I would say, because uh, sometimes we we think that we can solve some problems by moving to microservices, but uh, as you said, if we have this uh, really coupled uh, monolith where uh, the domain, we are not thinking about the domain, but everything is just uh, entangled together, yeah. moving to microservices really uh, won't help because we would end up having a distributed monolith and that will be even more difficult to handle in Kubernetes because then you have problems that some applications need to start before others. You have all this coupling also at deployment time and yeah. it's not really suitable for Kubernetes. So I think it's really important to understand when it's a, yeah, it's a good idea to move to Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah and I think if, if nothing else, uh, microservices, the one benefit that they give you is that they are independently deployable. But, like that's the one thing yeah. that microservices gives you, that you can make a change in one part of the of the system, and it, you only need to deploy that one thing. So my point is that if you have a if you've gone to microservices, let's say that, and all of your applications need to be deployed at the same time because mm -hmm. they need to fi have the same version of whatever XML parser or whatever. Um, that's not microservices. That's a distributed monolith. Yes. And it's a mess. <laughs> it is a mess. It is a mess. It yeah. is a mess, yeah. yeah. And, and <laughs> one, uh, I would say, anti pattern that I often see is that you add this common library that has common business logic that goes across all of your microservices. <laughs> and now you're dealing with versioning of that library in like uh, 20 different yeah. microservices. And quite, uh, quite soon it becomes that you need to deploy all these microservices at the same time because you have some business logic in your common library, and that's 
that's not good. And, and it becomes too tightly coupled again. Yeah, I think so sometimes these, the don't repeat yourself uh, principle that becomes an anti-pattern because we're, we want to follow it like uh, completely, but then yeah, microservices uh, really, sometimes it's not that bad mm -hmm. to duplicate code because then we have coupling and that's, yeah. that's not how things work in Kubernetes then. Yeah, yeah. I think it was, uh, was a Danish company that made a tool for actually copying and pasting code into different repos <laughs> for each microservice. That may be a little bit <laughs> overboard, okay. but, but the idea is that the, the common library that they were injecting into those services, uh, it didn't prevent one microservice from de being deployed before another one. And mm -hmm. there was no hard coupling between them. I think that's, uh, that's the point. Yeah. yeah, so migration tip, yeah. I would say that it's important to start small. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's something new that, uh, like uh, in the in the team, uh, mm -hmm. these technologies start with a small component. Uh, consider the twelve-factor methodology and the principles to make the application cloud native, and then maybe start moving that application to Kubernetes as an experiment, maybe on an internal environment, and see how it goes and learn, get feedback. No. Um, that I think that's really critical. It is before uh, committing to moving everything to be cloud native and to Kubernetes because. Yeah, we might learn something that uh, we didn't know at the beginning that might say mm, maybe Kubernetes not the best idea <laughs> in our case. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or maybe too expensive and yeah. Yeah, and I, and I agree totally because what we want to avoid at all costs almost is to have a big bang rewrite. Like yeah. management has decided that Kubernetes and Microsoft <laughs> is the greatest thing ever. So now we're going to re mm. uh, refactor and rewrite all of our services, our old monolith that actually has value. We're going to write, rewrite that in a microservices fat, uh, pattern, and we can't deliver any new features for the next six months or a year, right? Yeah. No. We don't want to do that. We want to deliver value as soon as we possibly can. Yeah. And, and that could be taking well, the one thing that is actually uh, the least coupled to the rest of the system, moving that into um, Kubernetes and, and having the old system call into that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because then you have that one service that you can now uh, you have more flexibility in that one service. You can do rolling upgrades, you can do experimentation on that one service, right? And then you can like uh, slowly chip away at the monolith and, and, and move it over. But you, <laughs> you want to deliver value as fast mm -hmm. as possible because there's, <laughs> there's people who are uh, paying you and giving you a budget, they expect results. And you can't say, no. oh, you get results in 12 months. <laughs> and that's a recipe for disaster, yeah. uh, it is. Yeah. yeah, I think value should be the like the first thing we, we discuss about. It's not like, uh, shall we move to Kubernetes, but uh, what is the value that we want to provide to customers, to the, to the business? And then yeah. at that point, we can see if Kubernetes matches that kind of value that we want to deliver. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't need to, to scale or we don't mm -hmm. need specific resilience uh, requirements that Kubernetes provides, then maybe it doesn't make sense to move to Kubernetes. So I think that starting with the the, the value proposition mm -hmm. really helps focusing on the actual value that we are providing with the software rather than the technology. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's easy to get caught into the technology discussion, especially yeah. in cloud native with all those tools that we have in the landscape. But uh, at the end of the day, we are, want to provide value, of course. Yeah. yeah. Do you think those tips, do they apply to greenfield projects as well? I mean, we've just been talking about moving existing code uh, and migrating that into a Kubernetes cluster, for instance. The, what, what would your tips be around greenfield projects? Is it worth it to sort of spend the time up front to get a cluster up and running and start from there? Or would you also sort of start with something small and then later see if it makes sense to move it into Kubernetes? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the, uh, I have done the, f the, the Kubernetes first approach uh, yeah. before. Um, and that's because like, that's what I know. So that's easy for me to do. That's a low hanging fruit. Running a Kubernetes cluster for me is, is easy, right? And yeah. developing on Kubernetes is also easy for me. So I can do it immediately. But I would, uh, you could also just go for a serverless a application, just running on Cloud Run mm -hmm. or uh, uh, Lambda or whatever, yeah. um, and get the value out. Like That's what you want. Um, but if you base your application in Greenfield or not, if you base that on the 12 factor app, you're in a better position to uh, to move to Kubernetes in the yeah in the near future. Um, so yeah. yeah, yeah, I would also embrace the cloud native principles for building the application. But yeah, yeah of course, I if the team already has knowledge uh, about Kubernetes, already has a platform that can be used, 
then yeah, I it's okay to go with that. But I'm thinking about startups, maybe starting a new product. You, you really want yeah. to get the product out there. Time to market is critical. Yes. So probably if you don't have already a platform and an established process to use in it, uh, it's not a good idea. There's already platform as a services down there from Azure, from VMware, from uh, Google, Red Hat. Uh, so just by following the cloud native principles, 12 factor, uh, you can use that platform directly so you can focus on the on the new thing that yeah. the startup is working on, the mm -hmm. business logic, and then maybe at some point you decide to move to Kubernetes. But at that point, the migration is seamless because uh, you already followed all the principles that are required in order to play nice uh, in a Kubernetes environment. Another thing I was wondering is, um, you mentioned before the just the number of uh, tools available in the ecosystem, um, I, I th and I think that's seen sort of a, an explosive growth over the last uh, couple of years. Do you think that's sort of stabilizing? Uh, are, are we still in a sort of period of rapid expansion, or are things evening out a little bit? I think we see some stabilization. Okay. I think we have, like if you go to the um, to the tech radar uh, from, I can't remember, uh, ThoughtWorks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are some uh, technologies that you can adopt right now, and they are stable, and they are well-defined and we know what they do. For instance, Kubernetes is, is stable and we know what it does. And Terraform, we know what that does and it has a, a business value as mm -hmm. well. Um, so we see some stabilization, but it's also rapidly expanding. So we have competing uh, message queues, we have competing standards for um, tracing and metrics, and all those things, right? Um, so I would take a look at the, the, the tech radar and see like, are there a, a solid foundation that I can mm -hmm. build my platform on and then we don't want to stagnate either. So we need to have uh, and plan for experimentation. Like, okay, maybe we build our app on whatever language. There's a new language with a new framework. Let's try that out in one microservice yeah. as an experiment. Yeah. And, and if you just say, okay, let's build the one platform to rule them all <laughs> and just build that one and forget about it, that's not going to work because things get mm -hmm. deprecated and you have uh, s vulnerabilities that come out, and you have people leaving the team, all those kind of things. So you need to prepare for constant change in your platform as well, mm -hmm. constant experimentation. Uh, that's that's my take on it anyway. Yeah, so handling the platform li like a product so that evolves just like any application that we build. Yeah, I mm. think that's important because now that more and more companies are moving to Kubernetes, I think we are learning also more about the experience of working with Kubernetes. So uh, there are new tools that are developed in order to maybe solve some issues that we might experience today or to make the experience both for developers and operators better. So uh, definitely it's, uh, it's good to look into the uh, CNCF landscape, uh, the tech ra radar also to, to know what is out there so that we have a, a stable foundation that we can build our business on, but also we can take advantage of new technologies if uh, uh, they provide some additional value okay. to the yeah. business. Mm -hmm. So where, where do you think things are, are moving? Is there anything out in the horizon that really excites you that uh, you want to talk about? So we didn't mention GitOps and delivery processes. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's one of those, it sounds like a mm. buzzword uh, a lot, but uh, I think it really provides value. Oh. So having this uh, approach where we decouple the uh, continuous delivery part where we take the application, we run mm -hmm. the auto-test, we package it as a container image, and then uh, the deployment part that happens via pull request. So we get all the nice properties that we have uh, in traditional application development. So we can do uh, peer reviews, we can uh, have a pull request, we have uh, traceability, also auditing of the changes, and then when mm -hmm. a pull request is approved, uh, automatically from the cluster we have a component like Flux CD or Argo CD that realizes, oh, there's a new change. So let's make sure that the new change is applied to Kubernetes. Yeah. I think that's a really powerful concept that m more than technological uh, change, I think it's m more a c uh, cultural change yeah. because maybe we are not used to do that. Mm -hmm. We are used to have different steps with different also governance um, uh, approval along the way. So I think that uh, the mindset for using GitOps uh, needs to change a bit. But once you, once you embrace that approach, I think uh, it, it becomes really powerful, it improves the quality, uh, and yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I think GitOps as well. Uh, I'm adopting it on all my projects, uh, and I think it's the way to go. Uh, I've personally chosen Flux because I think that's the, <laughs> the simplest one for me to grasp. Uh, and it's like the revolution that infrastructure as code was for infrastructure 
GitHub is the same for application deployments. Um, so yeah, totally agree on Flux and GitOps in, in general. Um, I'm also kind of curious to see what kind of higher level abstractions that people are now building. Like we have a framework coming out of Microsoft called Dapper. Like what mm -hmm. is that good for in a microservice setting? We have something called Temporal from uh, some people from Uber and uh, another company. Like there's some, some mm -hmm. higher level microservices frameworks that are now uh, becoming uh, more prevalent. There's also something called Wasm Cloud uh, that is I think that's higher level abstractions for mi for microservices. Mm -hmm. is, I think that's the next thing. Like you mentioned, what is the application and how do we deploy it? Um, and they come with built-in features, for instance, traceability and maybe message uh, message queue and message mm -hmm. passing for remote procedure calls. Um, that comes built in in the framework, and I think that's really really exciting. And right now, it's like in that exploratory phase. So we have all of those different uh, ideas popping up, and now we. Just have to wait and see what sticks. Yeah. 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 Another uh, thing that I'm really excited mm -hmm. to see how it will develop is uh, serverless, because so far we associate serverless uh, usually with uh, Lambda functions. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, that's really maybe a, a very different way of uh, thinking and designing applications. But we can take advantage of serverless technologies even with uh, uh, more standard uh, containers uh, application. So for example, Knative offers that capability. So you don't have to use a specific um, framework provided by a cloud vendor, but you have a, a sort of a neutral interface to have, for example, the scaling to zero feature. Yeah. So yeah. if there's no request, there's no reason to keep the, the application alive. And I think, uh, yeah, I'd like to see how we, will that uh, evolve also to be embraced for uh, more standard applications, not just functions. Yeah, serverless is also mm -hmm. super exciting. Yeah, I haven't used it that much, uh, to be honest. And it is a different paradigm to work in. And like it's a going from imperative to functional programming or going from HTTP synchronous communication to message-based uh, communication. Um, so yeah, serverless is, is, uh, is fun. And let's see where it, where it takes us. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we're, we're getting close to the end here. But uh, just before we finish, I was wondering if you have any uh, Definite do's and don'ts you would really would like to share, or any fun war stories? Yeah, war stories <laughs> is well when you build platforms yourself and you build applications at the same time, you sometimes get into difficult situations that you weren't expecting. Like as a consequence of running on Kubernetes, for instance, mm -hmm. I had a problem a couple of months ago where uh, my one of my services was not resolving a DNS name mm -hmm. uh, in my cluster. And like it was my logon service that couldn't it couldn't talk to my IDP, that was a pr problem for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And I I'd identified that the problem was that the version of Core DNS that we were running had a bug. Like we <laughs> we upgraded Core <laughs> DNS and like we had a bug. And yeah. the, the bug was actually inside DNS. Mm. Uh, yeah. And those kind of problems were kind of new to me. Like before mm. Kubernetes, I never really cared about DNS. Like it's something that we have, but. It always yeah. works, right? It's there. It's, it's there, and it works. <laughs> but now, because of the, the high complexity of running a service inside of Kubernetes that is talking to core DNS inside of Kubernetes that is actually talking to another DNS resolver outside of Kubernetes, like there's um, new communication pathways there and caching at different levels that can actually impact yeah. your service. So that's a war story for me in, in general terms. And I, I, I found the bug and re <laughs> reported it. And the guy from core DNS, he was like, huh. Yeah. That's that's impossible. <laughs> uh, it wasn't impossible, <laughs> but, but just very, it was just really, 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 really yeah. unlikely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it wasn't actually impossible; it was really unlikely. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like fun. I mean, even Facebook have troubles with DNS, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> PGP, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah Seven do? do's and don'ts. So, uh, one initial step when moving to to the cloud, mm -hmm. specifically to Kubernetes, is containerizing applications. So, my advice in that regard is. Oh. Uh, not trying to containerize whatever uh, you have at the moment, depending on where it is. So if you have, I don't know, maybe 10 applications deployed on one uh, Wildfly server, don't try to containerize the whole thing, <laughs> because you, you will regret it soon. <laughs> uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's important to keep mapping like one application, one container. I think that that's uh, extremely important. And uh, uh, maybe an another tip, so when uh, uh, moving to the cloud, uh, Try not to 
uh, like try to embrace the culture and the practices around cloud native like DevOps, yeah. because um, the risk is to ending up having these silos mm -hmm. where if you need something from the cloud, even if you switch to the cloud, you still have to go in Jira and open a ticket and wait for someone to, to do something about it. That, that's not really the cloud. No. Because one of the features of the cloud is the self-service uh, capabilities. So yeah. uh, I think it's important to clarify which is the API and having a self-service experience for developers. Yeah, and also embracing the community in general, like participate in meetups, participate yeah. in conferences, participate in open source, because that's where you really get the benefit. And you, like everybody else is kind of doing the same thing that you are and have maybe solved the problem that you're trying to solve. So, so look around you in your community and, and participate. I think that's, uh, that's also a key. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. Like, I'm really excited about all the open source uh, initiatives that are, are uh, out there. Like a recent one, for example, uh, VMware open sourced uh, their uh, Kubernetes platform. It's called VMware Tanzu Community Edition, totally okay. open source and free. Uh, it was great and it worked really well. Mm -hmm. Like I yeah. remember the day that they announced it, I installed it and I used it the next day for a presentation demonstrating, uh, like deploying Spring Boot applications with Kubernetes. Yeah. So it just worked without promise and I was really impressed. I think that's, that's, that's a brave. really <laughs> big part of uh, like, oh, the open source community is also contributing back. Right. I think it's uh, yeah, really a key factor. It is, it is. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you very much for uh, spending some time with me. It was a lot of fun chatting with you. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, Yeah, it was nice. Thank you for having thank us. You.